Next, we're going to keep moving. This person really doesn't need much of an introduction. I would dare say that he has probably visited with pretty much each and every one of you this week, and it's, uh, it's early in the week. Evan is always on the move. Evan Hershey, president of the National Wildlife Refuge Association, you will find him always on the move. And he has been a full and active partner in conserving the future conference. Not just Evan, but the National Wildlife Refuge Association partnered with, partnered with us to really bring in sort of the new technology, the new media, um, you know, the web-based, the very open process that we put together had a tremendous amount of Evan's energy put behind it and the success of it was really, you know, Mr. Evan Hershey. So the visionary ideas, like the Bold Ideas Forum, you know, can be attributed to Evan. Um, there are very few people who actually probably believe in advancing the cause of conservation through the newest marketing ideas and using all of the tools available than Evan. And I say that actually as a tribute to his zeal, as I already indicated. Um, he wants to get to know and he wants to work with each and every one of us and each and every one of you. Um, Evan is a tremendous supporter of National Wildlife Refuges. He has led the Refuge Association for 10 years, but his work on behalf of refuges stretches even farther back than that. He was on staff with the National Audubon Society, and while there he ran its refuge program. He has not only built the Refuge Association into a strong and recognized advocate for the refuge system, but he has given his leadership and talents to, the, to CARE, the Cooperative Alliance for Refuge Enhancement, and he has sat as the president of that coalition for the past two years. And for that, we thank Evan as well. Well, Evan applies his concepts about the environment to his own personal life. He rides a bicycle in Washington, D.C. And maybe when you're visiting with him, it's not always without incident. You might want to you might not find out a few things that have happened along that Rock Creek Trail. But in his off time, he also enjoys scuba diving. And he participates, and I believe he's in training right now for a triathlon. So when you know, when you talk to Evan Hershey, you just know he goes the distance in many, many ways. So with that, enough from me. Evan, please join us on stage here. Evan Hershey, National Wildlife Refuge System. Wow, well that was, that was a generous introduction. Um, I'm touched. Um, but you know what? Um, it's not about me. It's about an incredible staff that I have and an incredible board that this organization has. And the success of any organization, as you all know, is, uh, is empowering staff and the people you work with to do great work. So, um, you know, we've got a, uh, for, for those of you in this room who have not met and interacted with the NWRA staff and board, I certainly hope you do. Uh, it's a great bunch, uh, and they are as driven and committed uh, and as passionate as anyone I know. Um, and Greg, with respect to being a partner in this process, I mean, we've been incredibly honored. It's been, uh, it's been exciting and lots of twists and turns, but, uh, but it's been really phenomenal. And, you know, it's like a family reunion. I mean, this is wonderful. It's, it's, uh, it's a family reunion, but it's without, uh, of course, Uncle Henry's off-color dinner table remarks. So uh, we're fortunate for that, although maybe there are some of those out there. Um, you know, I did want to take a minute and express my, my special appreciation to all the Fish and Wildlife Service and NWRA folks who have worked so hard on this conference and this process. It has been an epic undertaking, and uh, I think it's going extremely well. And uh, you have all been a, just an unbelievable inspiration, so thanks to all, and you know who you are. And uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, both here and tuning in uh, over the internet, for uh, commenting on the document and providing bold ideas and insights and commentary. You know, as I understand it, this has been the most transparent process ever in government. And uh, it's heartening to see how many people have weighed in and provide their great uh, insights and, and information. Uh, so, look, um, changing gears here, I am about to hit you with a shocking photograph. And I need you to be prepared. Okay, you guys ready? Wait for it, wait for it. Shocking. So, so this tough little girl in the photo on the Jumbotron is me. 
1974. My fashion sense was informed by Bachman Turner Overdrive, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, and The Who. Note the belt with the inlaid silver diamonds, and no doubt my pants made the Liberty Bell look like a thimble. Um, I swore I'd never give them up. But uh, enough about me, that's overlooking the 37 uh, pound elephant in the room. And yes, no Photoshop here, no trickery. This was the Stonington Anglers Association 1974 striped bass winner in the junior division. And for a, thank you. <laughs> My dad got the 50, 59 pounder simultaneously, not to be outdone by his son. Um, but for a, you know, for a fifth grader, and weighing at a skinny 55 pounds, it was a battle of epic proportions. Still there, good. Uh, you know, without question, this was certainly one of the most cherished uh, experiences of my youth, and I remember it like yesterday. And it certainly serves as a not so subtle reminder of uh, what connected me to the natural world and gave me the passion for conservation. And for those of you under 40, Yes, we did have color film in 1974. <laughs> My father had a thing for black and white. And for those of you under 25, please don't ask me to explain what film is. <laughs> but the photograph also tells another story, and it's one about a dramatic crash and then the recovery of a species. And it's a story that's instructive as we refine and embrace this new vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System. In the years after landing this leviathan, striped bass populations in the 90s dropped from an estimated 50 million fish, uh, I'm sorry, uh, not in the 90s, um, in, the, uh, in the 80s, from an estimated 50 million fish to 5 million. And this was attributed to over-harvesting and poor water quality in stream areas. Uh, but a dramatic mobilization took place from North Carolina to Maine all of which imposed a moratorium. And combined with stocking nine million fingerlings in the Chesapeake, the striped bass population was fully recovered by 1995. And according, uh, according to the National Marine Fisheries Service, it's the most significant recovery of a, uh, documented for a coastal fin fish species, an extraordinary accomplishment. A migratory species throughout the Atlantic coast, the recovery of the striped bass required collaboration among multiple state and federal jurisdictions with the active participation and commitment of anglers, state governments, federal governments, water quality advocates, and others. It was an all hands on deck that paid off, uh, effort that paid off in spades. Now, the obvious takeaway message here, of course, is that good things happen when you bring passionate people together who are willing to try new approaches, tear down the institutional barriers, and put it all out on the table to achieve results. And that fundamentally is what we need to do to implement a new refuge system vision. Whether you're with the Fish and Wildlife Service, a state agency, an NGO, or a friends group, you are on the front line of conservation. You are among the very few in this country that have chosen to devote yourselves to ensuring a future for wildlife conservation in America. Now, this week and from now on, what we choose to do is a unified group of individuals and organizations has enormous ramifications for both wildlife and people, and not just within our national borders, but also at a global scale. No question, the challenges are great. And Jane Goodall just recited them. Every day, thousands of acres of wildlife habitat are destroyed. The competition for clean and fresh water grows. Native species are taking it on the chin as a result of invasives. Our coastlines are eroding to sea level rise. And all of this is compounded by the effects of climate change and a resource gobbling population that's expected to reach 9 billion people by 2050. Now, if we, achop, if we choose to adopt new ways of doing business, if we respond not through piecemeal actions, but coordinated strategies designed to leverage our science, our resources, and our expertise that cut across jurisdictional boundaries and engage the public with new and compelling messages, I believe will triumph in our cause. Now, that may sound like the lofty meanderings of an idealist, and full disclosure, 
I am both an idealist and an optimist, which may make me either a prophet or a fool, but there's good reason to think we have the ability to make it happen. Despite our persistent economic troubles, America remains the wealthiest nation on earth with extraordinary resources to do good. And regardless of a re recent backlash in environmental regulations, our nation has a legacy of pioneering conservation practices and continues to be looked to by the global community for their leadership. For this, we need to pat ourselves on the back for our successes. Though things sometimes look bleak and unyielding, we should take the time to celebrate what we've accomplished on scales both large and small. Whether the hard-fought hard recovery of waterfowl populations or the local elementary school teacher who calls a refuge and asks to bring their students back because they had such a wonderful visit the first time. Now, within the uh, vision document, sorry, within the vision document, there's ample admonishment for the need to work beyond the boundaries, to understand that we can no longer simply encircle habitat and proclaim victory. Instead, we've got to work hand in hand with the states, enlist participation of private citizens, and leverage fund Fish and Wildlife Service conservation funds and staffing against those of other federal agencies and private sources. There are already great successes on the ground, and yesterday Jim Stone, of course, spoke in colorful terms about the successes of the Blackfoot Challenge in Montana. But they're encouraging other models taking shape, including the partnership in the Northern Everglades, which we're pleased and proud to be a partner of, Flint Hills, Dakota Grasslands, and others. And in all cases, the secret sauce, if you will, is ensuring that all stakeholders at the table are fully invested in the outcome, while also leveraging the services, financial resources. Now, those who commit themselves to achieving these outcomes will be rewarded. Just this weekend, I received an email from Silvio Cani Refuge Manager Andy French announcing an MOU between the NRCS and refuges to collaborate in applying NRCS funds to county priority areas and sharing staff to make it possible. Great success. Now, for Andy, combined with his NASCAR to nature trail conversions, he's had a pretty successful run, I'd say, lately. Congratulations, Andy. Uh, and I want to uh, just uh, make a promotional plug this afternoon. For those of you who really want to get the feel and the buzz for Beyond the Boundaries and Landscape Conservation and hear for the, from the experts, this afternoon there is a program called Partnerships. And it's got David Houghton and it's got Gary Sullivan and, and uh, Joe McCauley. And these guys are all expert in landscape conservation work and I encourage you to attend. It's called Partnerships. But while we, uh, we always need to be thinking on a landscape scale, our hundreds of wildlife refuges throughout the country, many of which are in urban and suburban communities, couldn't be better positioned to take advantage of what could be the mother of all partnerships, the Grey Goose Battalion. Now you heard some of this, yeah, you heard me right. You heard some of this from Greg yesterday, but I'm gonna put a finer point on it. Now the news is in. Seniors are increasingly foregoing Tonto Verde and Coquino Crossing in Arizona and Florida, and instead choosing to stay in new retirement meccas like Rockville, Maryland, and East Harlem, New York. What this means is if we play our cards right, we're gonna be able to recruit an even greater volunteer powerhouse distributed across the country that will allow us to connect with diverse communities while also meeting our goals of getting kids and families outside. Now already, friends and volunteers contribute 20% of the work done on our national wildlife refuges, whether it's the Friends of COFA in Arizona operating a highly successful environmental education program for physically disabled elementary and middle school kids, or the Arthur R. Marshall Foundation reaching out to the African American community in South Florida through, their, through the Eyes of Children program, or the Friends of Pool 9 just up the road connecting with local communities through the Mississippi River Adventure Day. The impact that friends and volunteers are having on their refuges is nothing short of transformative. And I believe that there is a bright future ahead when we add the friends' infinite energy and passion to a deliberate enlistment of tens of thousands of re retirees that make up the silver tsunami. And I read that somewhere, I thought it was a nice phrase. 
But talk about limitless energy and passion and persistence. Since 1995, the Cooperative Alliance for Refuge Enhancement has been hard at it, lobbying for a stronger refuge system budget. Now, as you all know, as you all know CARE is a diverse group of 21 national conservation, scientific, and recreation groups many of which have sponsored this conference and their representatives are here today. Now, I think it's fair to say that care is to conservation what peanut butter and tuna and pita bread is to lunch cuisine. It's an unusual combination, but it's surprisingly potent when mixed together. <laughs> While members don't necessarily agree on all issues, they agree that refuges need more dollars to support conservation and wildlife recreation programs. As a result, and despite looming threats to conservation funding, the refuge system is in the best financial shape it's ever been in, thanks to the care group and refuge friends who have made their voices heard loud and clear locally and in Washington. Summing things up, if you look at nearly all that's good occurring in the refuge system today, I'd wager there's a partnership behind it. Now, to a person in this room, regardless of your stripes, we're here because we have a passion for wildlife in the outdoors. And that passion is shaped in each of us by different experiences and events. And we have sometimes different, uh, different opinions about how to get our business done. But at the end of the day, the underpinnings of our commitment to conservation bind us together. Our imperative this week and in coming months and years is to shape and institutionalize new models for conservation and public outreach that will ensure the survival of species, serve as powerful models for other nations to adopt in their conservation pursuits, and guarantee public support for generations to come. And that, my friends, is a lofty charge, but it's not a flight of fancy. You in this room have de demonstrated extraordinary commitment, passion, and resilience as you've worked to conserve our most important habitats, sought to generate interest from the public, and introduce children to the wonders of nature. You stand on the shoulders of American conservation pioneers like Teddy Roosevelt and Ding Darling, Rachel Carson, and of course, Aldo Leopold. And despite the grim messages from Washington, you have the resources and the wherewithal to achieve a vision that's bigger and bolder than anything before it. In the end, while we think of our charge in the context of saving species, as Sylvia Earle put it so poignantly yesterday, we are in fact saving ourselves. We're ensuring that next generations, those to whom we will pass the torch of responsibility, will feel the same sense of wonderment and excitement as children, whether gazing at a bald eagle taking flight, capturing minnows in a bucket, hitting a first bullseye, avoiding getting nipped by a crab's claws, or like my daughter Katie, just trying to hook the first big one. Thank you very much. <laughs>